everyone's teaching sales now. Fucking hilarious. Yeah. And the thing is, I've seen some of these people on accounts I've worked with, haven't been able to close a deal. If your ego and status isn't where you want it to be, and so you want to be known as like the salesperson, I think you can see that in the marketing of a lot of people. They'll keep saying the same like two things that they've done that is notable. What happens in a lot of roles is they come in with the promise of inbound leads, you know, set and close only. And in reality, it morphs into something completely different to that. Yet there's no conversation about different compensation. That's a separate deal. It's just expected that they will just happily do that for the same commission rate. And they're lazy and entitled if they don't do it. I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get the deliverables. I didn't get the support, but at least they introduced me to this market. And that was the justification for 6,800. And I'm, I'm like, well, you could introduce yourself for free. Dude, I'm going to jump in. I'm so sorry, but I'm not. Um... The internet is full of information. Some of it is the truth. Some are very misleading. And over the last couple of years, the high ticket online space has suffered a little bit from a lack of trust across the board from business owners to consumers to salespeople. But in all of that, there's a movement to make sure that we look after the integrity of what it is to be a remote sales professional. So a few weeks ago, after recording a podcast episode, uh, there was an idea to bring together some of the top minds in sales in a roundtable discussion. And the purpose of it is to tackle some of the topics around the high ticket space in the hope that we bring awareness to this industry and help elevate the standards of operation. I gathered some very smart people and we recorded episode one of the sales panel last week. And to quickly introduce this panel, so you have a bit of background on us. In this episode, we have Dean Kazora, founder of Hardly Selling, where he manages multiple sales teams, trains sales managers and sales reps as well. We have Michael Dunlevy, founder of True Sales Pro. It's a coaching program designed to take experienced sales professionals to another level. He also actively works on uh, an offer that is very high level mastermind where prices range from $25,000 to $90,000. JD Daly is part of the panel in this episode. He's the founder of Undeniable Closer Mastermind. It's a program that covers not just sales training, but business building as a sales professional, how to build your career in sales so that you always have opportunities. We have Will Hinkinson. He's a speaker, sales manager of high volume, high revenue accounts. He's a sales trainer across various industries and has been a sales manager in one of the biggest sales training groups in the world. As for me, I have several businesses across different industries and I'm the founder of The Collective Community, which is a private community dedicated to high level sales professionals looking to move into the next stages of their career. So at least now, you know where we're coming from and where our opinions are based. With that said, let's get into the video. Um, but yeah, on, on this list, um, there's a couple of things in here that, that um, you know, I think it's good topics just in general. One of them, uh, and, and this is not, not in particular order, but um, there's a question in here. What is accepted as the norm in the, in the online, I'm assuming in the online sales space that you wish would stop? Mm. You see that? What is accepted mm -hmm. as the norm in the online sales space that you wish would stop? So I'll float, floor's open. Here's it to, to, to kick it off. I'll open, I guess, unless anybody yeah. else wants to go. No, no, you, you go for it. I think for me, you know, it's an interesting one. Uh, background, 10-year special operations community, then owning a couple of businesses, then finding out my wife was pregnant, being so concerned that I would be a terrible dad because I get obsessive about growing businesses, that I sold my last business. I kind of gave it away to my staff and then went into sales full time. And I think the thing I was really surprised about from the beginning, especially in like high ticket sales, information product sales, was the lack of follow up inside of a lot of that stuff. And I think there mm -hmm. is an argument to be made for sales reps who go, hey, I'm a 1099 contractor. Like I can kind of run it the way I want to, as opposed to a business owner dictating. And I think that's a legitimate argument to an extent. But I also think if you want to be a professional, you have to, yes, be good on calls, and that takes a little bit to develop, but also be able to run this like you would any professional career, where if you didn't follow up with people in any sort of SaaS company or anything that's a Fortune 1000, where you have managers looking over your pipeline, like you would get executed on that team. And so I think that's the one thing that I, would, I wish would stop, where it's only about close rate, 
And it's not about what is the process and the pipeline that you're following overall to be a true professional. Mm. Who's for me? Dude, I love that, man. Um, but it all, it all started when high ticket closing became a thing. Make 10K anywhere using your cell phone, just taking it on calls. Mm. And it's, it's, I love that you brought that up because, dude, I even have reps on some of my teams and they just like won't manage their pipeline. They won't do the admin work. And it's like, well, dude, this is part of the job. You know, like if we're putting calls on your calendar, like we expect you to see them through. And they're like, well, I'm taking inbound calls. I was like, well, not everyone wants to pay right away. So I think the, the norm in my mind is that people can make money easily, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a misunderstanding of what a sales cycle actually is, like what it truly looks like lead to close. And because shit's been so easy for so long for so many people, they've never had to do that latter 60% of work that now might be turning into 70, right? Some companies, mm -hmm. it's even heavier. I have a team we work with, our average lead to close die time is 108 days, it's huge. Mm -hmm. So like, I would say the laziness and like the entitlement that entitlement. I'm only taking inbound calls. It's like, well, yeah, you are, but there's also other stuff that comes with the job. You're yeah. not gonna go grill burgers at McDonald's and leave the grill fucking dirty at the end of the night. Like you're probably gonna clean <laughs> right? Yeah, you gotta follow, follow yeah. something along, I, along that way, I, yeah. Jenny? Yeah, I, I think that kind of leads into my point in that I resist the urge to talk about norms because what we do is not normal. And what Will do, does is not normal. And what Patrick does is not normal. And what Michael does is not normal. And what Dean and what I do, are, there's, there's no norm. And I think when you start to set a norm, especially early on, people want to come in. They want to know, is this normal? Because they're afraid to misstep. And I think what happens is we start to accept that things are just normal. They're good or bad. Or, but is it normal doesn't really answer much. Uh, I think to Dean's point, these things have to be communicated. And on the sales side, I talk to a lot of people that sometimes get blasted as entitled or lazy and they just don't know what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think both sides need to do a better job of communicating. I don't have anything against a company. I, I, I love the freedom of the space. And I think a business owner should be able to operate the way a business owner should. There's very few things that you can do and have total freedom. I think who you marry and who you choose to be with, right? Who you choose to hire and and who you choose as your friends, I don't think anybody can say anything about those things. And so I think that how you want to operate your business is totally up to you, but you need to communicate that. So what I'd love to do is get rid of all the norms. I, I hope that there is no norms because then that sets this false expectations. I think these ideas that you have to work as a setter starting out, that you have to go through a placement agency, that you have to learn sales on day one, or that would be like a surgeon you know, going into surgery without training. All of these examples, the norms are typically found in marketing to gravitate people towards what the person needs you to believe to buy more. And so mm. I'd say just get rid of all the norms and say, each organization is ran by a human. Each human is different. Each business mm. is different. I've worked on 47 different offers. I've never found two that are the same. And so for me, it's about finding out not expecting that something is going to be normal or not, but communicating what are my expectations as a rep and understanding what the expectations of the business owner are. And that's, mm. I don't care outside of that relationship, what anybody thinks, if I'm entitled, if I'm doing this, if I'm supposed to do that, as long as the prospects are happy, I'm happy and the business owner are happy. Everybody else can kind of go fuck themselves, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> can I probe on that? <laughs> So yeah. on that, JD, is that okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. um, you, know, you know, it's 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 interesting because like we have these business owners who run eight hundred thousand dollar a month businesses, and they think they're fucking ballers. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not shit. Hmm. Um, like it's really not. Go look at what Apple did last year. Like that's a business. Um, but like I think like what what we're nailing down to is expectations. Like they think that because they run a business doing X amount people should know these things. And there's unmet expectations to business owner, unmet expectations to sales rep. And the sales rep has come from the world of inbound calls. The business owner is like, yo, I need you doing these things. But like no one ever fucking talks about it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dean, yeah, on totally. that end, because this, this is an interesting one. How much, and I'd actually, I'd be curious for everybody here. 
Mm. How much do you guys look at it when you guys were all full time selling? And then, Michael, I think you still are, right? I still sell. Yep. Mm. Yeah, nice. Right. Mm. How much of that do you look at, especially where we're all at in our career? Mm. How much do you try to up manage a little bit of the business owner, Mm. whoever it is there? (laughs) Where you're like, oh, they're, they don't really understand how this works. They don't really understand a sales cycle. They don't really understand a sales process. They're very usually good, depending on the size of the company, good marketers. They might be good managing finances a little bit, mm-hmm. usually not great. A little bit. Not, not, not really. <laughs> how much of that do you look at as the sales reps, if you have a little bit of experience, ability to up manage the expectations of whoever's overseeing you there? Man, that's a that's a great question. Michael, I'd love your take on that one. Well, in the roles that – I'm drawn to roles that are probably different to a lot of the roles that Dean and Will in particular are involved in. For example, I, I never work with sales managers, for starters. As a start point, I'm drawn to roles and opportunities that are probably quite different to the worlds that Will and Dean in particular are in, i.e., sales managers don't exist in my world. Uh, they just don't. I, I deal direct with the owner, and that's it. No exceptions. So – I, I'm always in a collaboration as well. So there's ongoing dialogue. So I, in the one account I still sell for, I have a weekly meeting, one 45-minute we- meeting per week. But it's not them micromanaging me. They don't listen to my calls. They don't tell me what to do. We don't go near any of that. It's having an open conversation about how can we make this better. And that covers all aspects of the business. So in that regard, do I upmanage? Maybe in some ways, you know, in, but really it's just collaboration, open dialogue. So personally, I'm drawn to those sorts of roles. Um, I did want to bring up something, Will, that you said a moment ago. You know, you talked about the example of 112 days or, or something like that from initial point to close or something like that. I mean, at, at what point does a salesperson come involved in that? Is that on the first day or halfway through or the last third? Or what does that all look like for a typical closer? You said Will. Did you mean Dean? Oh, is it mean Dean? Oh, maybe I meant Dean. Sorry, I got you guys confused. Apologies. Dean, yeah. I'm going to throw it back to you. I wanted to bring that I up. I think you said 108-day day sales cycle or something. Yeah. Like Let me just go bring one up, and I'll just read to you the sales cycle here, just so is you that- can kind of see how it works. Hmm. We have one that closed yesterday. Let me just pull up his freaking his sales cycle right here. This was a... This one was actually two days, so that one was quick. Mm-hmm. One before that, the first touch point, he opted in on the 12th of December, 2022. Salesperson reached out to him a month later, another day later. So he was consistently getting followed up with weekly or monthly by sales reps. And it took this guy, lead to close was 490 days. Wow. And he was calls from the team every single week. Is that is that the norm in your world? So, I mean, I think it's different for every account, but like if someone's reactivated within the CRM, they're buying something new, they're engaging in content. Yeah. We have workflow set up that bring them top of chart for people yeah. to call. Yeah. Because if you're doing something in our system, like, dude, we have um, their IP tracked to where when someone clicks something, when they buy something, when they do something, like we know it. Yeah. Like if, if I'm an SDR, like, hell yeah, I want to talk to the people that are clicking my shit. Yep. So yes, it's the norm. But we also have someone that just closed in six days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We closed yep. with six days. So it's like an average. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's the norm. And I think, yep. I don't want to say it's the norm, but it should be because if people are engaging in your stuff, like talk to them. But I, I think- the problem is most people after lead gets to a certain amount of days old, they're just like on to new ones. Yep. Yeah, I think it comes back to what I think JD said earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, expectations and communication. You know, a role like that, I personally wouldn't be drawn to, but I can understand others would. I mean, that's a classic SDR, you know, sort of role, and that takes a long time. As long as that's communicated ahead of time and that's what the expectations are, you know, there's no gray areas. Like, they know they're signing up for that. Well, then you have a right to accuse them of being lazy if they don't do it. But I think what a lot what happens in a lot of roles is they come in with the promise of inbound leads, you know, set and close only. And in reality, it morphs into something completely different to that, yet there's no conversation about different compensation. Uh, You know, that's a separate deal. It's just expected that they will just happily do that for the same commission rate and they're lazy and entitled if they don't do it. I think that's where a big disconnect is. So if you want to talk about what we should have less of in the industry, I think it's that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the major point um, is the expectations in between where the thing starts to become a norm to where the reality actually is. 
um, just a final point, and I'm curious for, for all you guys here, is that like how did how do these things like if it's if it's the things that we kind of don't want to see or um, norms that we we, we don't want to accept, how does it become the norm? I know through marketing and everything else, that's kind of how how it happens. Is it just there? There's more people in our space that don't understand the expectations or how to manage these things, like what we were saying, you know, how to manage, how to up manage. I think that's an important point as well. Um, why is it that, you know, the majority of people have like very little expectation and entitlement when, you know, when, and in reality, like we all, we all see it happen. Do you know what I mean? Like how does, how does it work in that way? I used to get really frustrated by this because I used to see exactly what Michael's talking about where people would go, great. And I think we've all seen the classic example. It's gone away for the most part over the years. It's at least better than it was. But it's like, mm -hmm. cool, you, you go in, you end up talking to a business owner. They're like, sweet, you've got great marketing. Marketing's awesome. We can stack your calendar. You're going to get five to eight booked calls per day. And then you end up getting in there and it looks closer to five to eight per week. Like, how does mm -hmm. that happen? I used to get very frustrated with that. Not, uh, I didn't, I experienced it a little bit as a rep, but I saw it much more running a fairly large done for you sales organization. And so within that, I was like, where is this coming from? And I finally just asked the owner, like I was frustrated one day and they were a good, like really good guy. And I was like, Hey man, what, what, what made you put that out originally? Like, where did that come from? And he's like, well, that's what everybody else was doing. I didn't think I could get good sales talent unless I did it. And I kind of probed and clarified a little bit further than that. I was like, yeah, but you're, you're a super smart dude. Like, yes, you're a great marketer. But you're also a smart guy. Like you, you knew kind of that wouldn't live up to it. He's like, yeah, but how else do I get talent? And so I, I don't want to be like, hey, it's not the business owner's fault. Like it 100% was his fault. But like I yes. look at where did that come from? Because I don't think it came from a place of maliciousness. I think it came from a place of they don't, most business owners... If you're going after a business, I think that's in the seven figure range as opposed to the eight. And certainly, Michael, with some of the higher, higher level folks that you're working with who have nine figure businesses and are running other stuff and doing all that, I just don't think they know. And I think there's a lot of insecurity there on their end. Now, is that an excuse? I don't think it is. But mm -hmm. I do think that that's the place where it's coming from. And I think that is prevalent and pervasive amongst people that want to present sales teams as an easy thing to run. They're not. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to get good talent, and it's certainly not easy to manage and to lead those sales teams. So I think you've set it off on the wrong foot from day one, which is a mistake, but I can see how it can happen. Yes. It's a good point. I would, um, I, I would agree with that, and I would, I would add to that. It's just as much the salesperson's responsibility to ask the right questions and get clarity on the real picture. And if you don't do that, then don't be surprised if you end up in a situation where two or three weeks later, there's a massive disconnect. Everybody's frustrated. Nobody's happy and it doesn't go to a good place. Um, so I think the onus is on the salesperson as well. Like, yes, in a perfect world, the offer owner wouldn't mislead for whatever reason, but most salespeople, not all, most are so naive and so subservient and so desperate that they're just happy to be accepted and approved. And they say yes without asking real questions. And then a new reality presents itself and it's a bad place to be. Yeah, and the business owner just runs with it and then they accept it. Yeah. Kind of like the argument or the, the statement in a seven-figure business because they did 80K a month once. Yeah. They probably booked that in a week once and they're just riding that high and it hasn't really like hit them that it's never going to be like that again. Yep. It's like if we did 80K this month, I can go parade and I have a seven-figure business. It's like, well, no, the fuck you don't. Mm -hmm. I have five or seven bookings a day for you. Well, you did that once. Calm down. Mm. Like yeah. really have that. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, a, I think, that I wasn't thinking that. I think it has a lot to do with the strategies and how these jobs are being found as well. And I think um, ever since a bunch of kind of middle people came in and, and introduced this as kind of a make money online rather than a career move or, or a business move. Um, I think that there's just a lack of information and people are coming from the nine to five, leaving that, um, but they're bringing those elements in. And I think it, it takes a level of understanding that a job post is an advertisement. It's advertising a job. And anybody who knows you shouldn't be buying on advertising. That's why sales exists. And what you buy is the deliverables. What is the exchange? And so I think just like, 
going through a sales process, you have to understand that when you see a job post, that is more marketing the job than it is the deliverables. And so going through that process, uh, the thing that helped me was just stepping away from the traditional job market and stopped applying for jobs and stopped going through recruiter pipelines and realized that, hey, there's there's a big drop off. I mean, when I started in this industry, 15% was standard. I was negotiating 20%. All of a sudden, more and more people got in between the business owner and the salesperson. And what I noticed happened, one, about 33% of our commission was pretty much dropped right off the bat from most people. 10% became the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to be the setter commission. And two, because there's so many people in the middle and they're kind of double dipping, Again, there's there's some great people in the middle. There's also some people that are just running profit machines. What happens is there's a lack of communication and connection between both sides. And of course, when there's a lack of communication and, and both have to go through this filtering system and they're being sold on both sides that, hey, you're getting a reps and hey, you're getting a business. When you get when you finally get to the dance, you realize it's not the person that you wanted uh, to invite. And so I think. From what I found, a lot of these things went away when I was able to sell my service to a business, when I was able to talk to these businesses, because again, these, these people are getting paid five to $18,000 to introduce me to a business. I can introduce myself. And so I realized that, hey, I can build my own pipeline here. And so mm -hmm. I started going direct to businesses. I started communicating what is the problem? What's the goal? What's the vision? Here's what I can do for you. Here's what I won't do for you. And let's sit down and, and negotiate terms and, and let's see if there's alignment there. And if there's not, maybe I can find someone who, who is more aligned. But as I bridged that gap and leaned on less people to make introductions and to access certain pipelines, I was able to communicate more on my terms and and also understand the business more deeply um, not having to kind of jump through those hoops mm. yeah i think that's a good uh, good point too in terms of like taking responsibility as a sales rep i think i think we all can make the change um happen and and, and shift these norms into other places but it does take the business owner and the sales rep both parties to right. kind of wisen up to it to it all so um i think there's some really good points in that one um this topic i think is a uh, I think it's a good one. Very contentious. Um, I, I certainly cringe sometimes when I say this, but um, guys, in your opinion, when should someone be able to start teaching sales to mm. others? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I think Dean, you bought you bought that one up, or you, oh, you saw yeah, it on the yeah. list. Do you want to kick well, us dude, off? I, I I I was like, dude, we should talk about that next because everyone's teaching sales now. Mm. Fucking hilarious. Yeah. And the thing is, I've seen some of these people on accounts I've worked with haven't been able to close a deal. Hmm. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, why do you think it happens? Why, why, what's the, because I mean, I, yeah, I see it all the time too. Because it's easy. You know what I mean? It's so easy to look at a process and find out what's missing. Right? It's much easier to look at something and find what's missing than it is to actually do it and make sure you don't miss that. So much easier. But it doesn't mean you're actually good at it because, of course, if someone misses a tie down, if someone misses handling objection, anyone can fucking see that. Stevie Wonder can see that. <laughs> right? Like We're very clear that it's not hard to like help someone on a sales call. But the thing about it is I think there's good and then there's great. And I think most people are good because they're just not dumb. They can objectively look at a sales process A to Z and say, oh, well, you could have said this, this and this. But there's a big difference between going in and coaching someone and just like derailing them and telling them where they missed. And the flip side of that is being able to give them constructive feedback to where it actually helps. I think there's a big difference there. So mm. the question is, when should someone be able to start teaching sales to others? I mean, I'm a big fan of capitalism, so do whatever you want. But I do know, and what I've seen before and what we're seeing with a bunch of people, the little shoot up is going to shoot right back down. Because... You can coach one or two people. You can find someone, fix a few things, and it'll it'll definitely help. But it's not going to last because you actually have no idea what you're doing. You're you're also just capturing the biz op market of idiots who want to be better, right? And it's very easy to take someone who has like a little bit of skill and give them a little bit more. But how do you take someone from two to three, three to four? Like that's the hard shit. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that is I don't think most people should. But I mean, if you want to do it and charge a thousand bucks to a bunch of random people, cool. Like you're going to capitalize on your warm market really quick. And once that warm market is done and they have a bad month because they will, they're going away. So I hope you saved that money because it's not going to continue coming.
Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd love to go to, to Michael on this one because you you don't necessarily deal with the the, the biz up crowd, the zero to zero to ones. Um, where- Not in, no. Look, I, I agree with Dean. Like in the sense that people can do what they want, and the market will decide. I mean, so that's there as a start point. I you know it's hard not to find it a little bit humorous, and I don't want to be a gatekeeper to anyone's prosperity and dreams and all those things. So I'm not going to be. But you know, you, you probably all know that I have a, a sales training mentoring program, and I have people that three, four months ago were in my DMs asking to come in my program and they didn't, which is their right not to come in. And I could tell by the interactions and seeing their Facebook that they're pretty low level. Some of those people are now got sales programs, which I won't say any names, but it's just like, okay, okay. But the market will decide. Uh, people can do what they want. People can choose to go where they want to go. Again, a little bit like what I said to Will before about not pinning all the blame on the offer owner who misleads with numbers. The student has to do their research as well. They have to learn how to ask the right questions and apply the right criteria uh, and make a judgment based on all the information that comes their way. So mm. I don't have a strong opinion on it. People can do what they want. The market will decide is, is basically my, yeah. my line. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm happy for people to do their thing. I, I, I do find it humorous uh, sometimes. It's, like For me, it's more what they're leading those people to in regards to their, their own career and their own you know, yep. prosperity, whatever, whatever it is, uh, I think sometimes it can be very misguided, and and that person, and again, you know, they have to do their due diligence uh, and and their own research anyway. Um, but but sometimes when blind leads the blind, you know, they end up in just a totally wrong place, and then yep. and then it becomes a big generalization of you know people not uh, you know not capitalizing on things or not not understanding the industry or not things not working out. You know, mm. so that. It's kind of where I where I see the flaws um, in it. Uh, JD, I might ask you, you. You train a lot of people in all different uh, stages of their career, and you would have seen some graduate to do bigger, better things. Some not so much. Yeah. Listen, I've I've never shied away from from calling out what I feel is misleading or uh, people who under deliver. Um, and and I think that when I started, there was two programs that were really kind of misleading and, and under delivering. And I spoke up loudly and guess what? Those two went away and 300, 400 popped up. And I, I think that there's always going to be people pop up. And I think that's part of the free market. I think it starts with education. And I think that salespeople, especially veterans, um, I'm not going to say they need to take responsibility, but I, I think they have the ability to impact the future of this industry. And I think that a lot of salespeople go through those struggles early on and then they figure it out and then they focus on sales and they don't communicate how they got there. I think um, a lot of high performance salespeople are uh, not as open to networking with newer people because they're not on their level. Uh, they're not as open to sharing some of the wisdom on a, on a public level. And it's like, uh, speaking of the blind leading the blind, well, we have the ability to communicate those things. But if people who have seen it from a different view do not communicate, well, then it continues, right? If, you know, it's, it's kind of that rite of passage that everybody takes a bad training and everybody takes a, the wrong offer. Well, that shouldn't be a rite of passage because we should be able to communicate those things. And I personally feel I have a responsibility. I can't speak for anybody else, but I have a responsibility of warning people of the missteps and the mistakes. Uh, I said on a, a recent podcast with uh, Nomadic Closer that the mistakes I've made are probably the most valuable things I have because I see people making the same mistakes over and over and over again that I made seven, eight years ago. That doesn't have to be. And I feel like that's really stunted the potential evolution of this industry because we're not sharing wisdom and we're not having these types of collaborations and we're not passing all that experience down uh, other than behind a paywall. And so I think speaking openly and having conversations like this and, and sharing and kind of paying it forward. You know, I think everybody, mm -hmm. when they have something to give, they, they keep it behind a paywall and there's nothing wrong with that. I have a program as well, but I think also sharing that wisdom to the next generation so that they can surpass and, and get there even quicker, I think uh, is really mm. important. I, I think the challenge is, JD, I, I agree with what you're saying, and um, but I think the challenge is the, the bad actors, if that's what you want to call them, you know, often have a louder voice and get to uh, those coming in before we do or, mm. or people with good intent do. 
And I think they say the things that they want to hear, not necessarily what they need to hear. I mean, if I look at your content, it's not what they want to hear, it's what they need to hear. But, and it's often comes weeks, months, years after the bad actors got their first via ads or aggressive marketing or other means and told them all the things that they wanted to hear and they had to find out the hard way on the back of it. So how do you get ahead of that? If, if you agree with that premise, how do you get ahead of that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you're ever going to avoid it fully, but I think if one person can create a community and have these conversations, I think um, it needs to come not just from the business owners, but also from other salespeople. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people who are afraid to leave a negative review after they go through a program. And mm -hmm. I also see the standard really low, which I've, I've never seen as low as it has been. I talked to maybe three or four people that ended up joining UCM last week. And, and what they were saying was, well, I did pay $6,800 for this program. I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get the deliverables. I didn't get the support, but uh, at least they introduced me to this market. And that was the justification for 6,800. And I'm, I'm like, well, you could introduce yourself for free. And so I think it's this kind of, uh, and, and companies do a really good job of, of creating these tribes and, oh, we have free training if you leave a trust pilot review. And so I think that, yes, they speak louder and yes, they put a lot into marketing. But I, I also think that we have the volume to be able to speak consistently and be in those spots um, and and all do our part. Will it eliminate it totally? No, but will it put a dent in it and save, you know, a few good people? Absolutely. Dude, I'm going to jump in. I'm so sorry, but I'm not. Um, Got in. A lot of the, a lot of these people that are jumping in and doing the sales training. And as JD said, the loud voices up front, they're, they're promoting like one or two things they've done. I hit X amount this month. I'm the shit. And people are like, Oh my God, that's incredible. It's like, well, if I promoted what I made last month, everyone would want to hire me too. I just don't care about promoting that stuff. But you'll always see a few people, they'll promote one or two things that they've done because they can't fucking replicate it. And they think because they've done it once, they now have the ability to teach others to do it. It's like, well, dude, there are so many factors outside of your skill set and your ability that got you there. Because yes, that is a part of it. But how was the market at the time? How many of those went through financing? What was the world of finance like during that period? Like were interest late rates low? Was it easy to get loans? Was it a new hot topic, right? Did crypto just come out and everyone, that's the new thing? Just like with sales training in the beginning, like people were buying it like fucking like mm. not case, right? Because it's like, oh, I can make, like it, it's, there's so many factors in it that I don't think people have a realistic view. They've done something once and they think the mm. only factor that made sense in them winning is themselves. When in reality, if you pull them out and place someone else there, there's probably a, quite a few other people who could have done just as well, if not better. Right. So it's yeah. an inflated ego from doing something one time that they're like, I could teach this to everyone. Well, can mm -hmm. you fucking replicate that shit over and over and over? And then can you do it for someone and prove that you've done it for someone over and over and over? And once you do this, dude, go fucking buck wild. Mm, do it go, I think yeah. you see it in their marketing. I think it comes through in their marketing every time when you know what to look for. And like to the original question, when should somebody be able to start teaching sales to others? I think Charlie Munger's advice from Carl Jacoby that he popularized of inversion is super applicable here, which is what's a terrible reason to start teaching sales? I think if you just like the business model and you're like, I can make a lot of money doing that. I think that's a terrible reason to start mm -hmm. teaching sales to other. If you're, Ego and status isn't where you want it to be. And so you want to be known as like the salesperson. I think that's another terrible reason to mm. do it. And I think you can see that in the marketing of a lot of people. Now, to yes. be fair, I'm not saying everybody that's doing this is, is that person. They might just be getting started, finding their voice. Like there, there's a whole piece to that. But I think in general, you'll see, you know, Dean mentioned it. They'll keep saying the same like two things that they've done that is notable. What I see in people where I'm like, oh, they have something. I don't necessarily know what it is, but they have something. It's a principle. They're coming mm. back to a principle that applies in the situation that they're discussing every single time. Now, that's where we get into like tactics and what's everybody's flavor. But it's like, cool. If your only promotion is I trained this team and they have this result and you just keep coming back to that over and over again. Like I'm not hearing the principle behind how they got that mm. result. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's title. concerning for me, and that's what I look for anytime. Mm-hmm. Like I see stuff. That's why everybody here. And when I saw you put the the chat together, Patrick, I was like, I don't know everybody's philosophy here, but I've mm-hmm. seen some of the you know the the posts that everybody puts out and kind of the brand. It's like everybody here has principles they're working off of. It doesn't feel like something that's surface level that they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And that's what I look for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think it's a, uh, yeah, lack of principles. And, and there are some people I think legitimately will do really well uh, as they share their methodology or their principles, like you said, because they have it. Um, I do think a lot of folks who do it is for the cash uh, simply because they're not creative enough to figure out other ways to do it. And it seems like the easy route because, you know, they've, they've seen launches of um, sales training and it's done really well and they, people get a lot of comments and then things like that. But the longevity of it and the reality of it being around for a long time, uh, I, I think that's kind of where it's where it falls down and where it's forward. So um, I think that's, um, yeah, that's really good for, the, for that um, uh, topic. There, there might be a lot of uh, sales trainers now that are going to start disappearing because of, because of this, but I think it's you good. I think we start naming names. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got first thing. In the, in the yeah. next episode, we we probably could yeah. put a couple on there if you guys are going to follow through. <laughs> He'll do it in a heartbeat. So let's avoid that. But what what I think but, might be interesting because I think we're all of the same mind in the generalities of the industry, but I think there's probably some different styles that we have on this call. I don't know if you guys would be up for this. I don't even know what the question would be, but what are some things that we here would disagree about? And we can all kind of bring our, our place of understanding into the conversation and hopefully all end up elevating. Are you talking about from a sales perspective or? I I mean, I think that's a great place to start for sure. (laughs) I think what he's asking is what is it about someone on this call that you disagree with? Well, we can we can go down that route. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good topic, for sure. Who, who wants to go? Who wants to go first? Well, JD and I did a podcast dedicated to this topic about a year ago. Uh, oh, well, let's revisit. Should price, should price and qualifying come early in the conversation, or should it be left towards the end? So we we had oh, a, we both understood mm-hmm. each other's position, but I think we had a preferred different way of doing it. I was more of the as early I know as possible. you have a preferred model. So you were yeah. more of the the latter. So that's that's one example. I don't know if you've changed position on that, JD, or not, but. I no, and it's not that I've changed position. And this is where where me and Michael thought that there was going to be these yeah. kind of arguments we could go back and forth. And what we found was there's very little that I disagree with. Mm-hmm. And because, again, if you look at what Dean's done and what Will's done and what Patrick's done, and Michael, you can't argue with experience. Mm-hmm. I can't say that, hey, Michael, what you do doesn't work. Well, it's working. Just as he can't say that. You know, you can't make my experience invalid. And so we have preferences. Yep. Um, but to me, it's it's so situational. And that's one of the biggest challenges that I'm facing now in teaching UCM students is they, they've been told that there is a methodology out there. There's a tactic. There's a word flow. And once you get that, it's optimal and it's perfect. And you say these and everybody just drops like dominoes. And mm. what I've been working on in the last year or so is this situational selling is understanding that there has been times where it made sense in the flow to price up front there's also been times where it makes sense to hard qualify up front there's been times on certain campaigns where it made sense to soft qualify and and have the discussion later and so i think for me and i know we kind of i went off topic but for me, everything is so situational and there is so many different paths to success here that I tend not to disagree with anything other than the one size fits all. The, the one thing that I do disagree with is, and, and there's statistics to back this up, that there is one methodology that you can use to get to the top, this big 1% that everybody talks about now, and that's a big selling point. Um, the studies have shown something very different. The mm-hmm. studies have shown that once you get even into the top 15%, forget the mm-hmm. top 1%, and they listen to people's calls and they found pieces of three to four to five different methodologies. And I think all of us mm-hmm. can attest to you've picked up things along the way and you hear those little one line or you're like, ooh, that's good. Oh, or that. you say something, you're not even sure what you're saying, but it comes out and then you you use that forever and you picked up little pieces along the way. And so I think anytime 
you know, instead of it's the mixed martial arts analogy, right? If you can be a boxer versus a mixed martial arts, the person that has kind of a wider discipline um, is ready for more situations. And so, mm -hmm. well, I, you know, I love that analogy for a couple yeah. of reasons. One, I am well, a boxer. I still take a couple of fights a year, amateur level. I'm nothing special, but the flip side of that is at a certain level, hundred percent, somebody who's really good at mixed martial arts. Like I have a, I have a puncher's chance cause that's my main focus, but if they take me down, I'm done for the most part. Now I, I'm, I'm trying to find a contentious point here so we can have a hot discussion. That's really what I'm looking for. <laughs> my feeling on it is until you've got a base built up, it is actually better to follow one system because the thing that I've seen among sales reps is confusion. And when you're trying to mix a bunch of different things that you don't know why it works and you end up confused on your call, the energy, the dialogue, the conversation that, and you can hear it as they're going through, mm -hmm. they don't really know where to take the prospect. They have no place to come back to. There's no anchor point. So those conversations usually don't go the way that they could in terms of skill set, in terms of moving that person forward, getting them out of the way. Do you guys think differently about this? Would you rather have a wide kind of exposure to a bunch of different styles and then pick what's right for you? Or would you rather stick to one in the beginning until you nail that and then from there expand out? Mm -hmm. What I really like, I actually was arguing with someone on Facebook not too long ago. Surprise. Um, but I was arguing with someone on Facebook a while ago about the necessity for sales training in the beginning. And I was like, no, like you don't need it. You need to find your way. And when you find your way, you will find out what works and what doesn't work. Because I, I think everyone gets stuck into one ideology, one, one method, or they try and do 10 methods. And if they stick to the one method and the method just isn't for them, but they think it's the shit, it drives them down the wrong path. So when I got into sales, I actually didn't take any sales training. I had a script that I read over. It's like, cool. And what I found worked really fucking well for me was a hell of a lot of rapport. I would spend seven or eight minutes like actually like connecting with the person on a deep level. Then I would go in to sell them. And because I had that buy-in and leadership, I was able to close them. Now my sales philosophy is very different, right? I actually don't give a shit about making friends with them. I connect, I hold leadership right away, and I don't give a fuck if they buy and they feel that, right? Mm -hmm. And it helps me lean out really hard. So I think in the beginning, like before saying one methodology, one thought process, I think the most important path for anyone is to fall on your face really fucking hard multiple times on multiple calls. And then as you do that, find what works, what doesn't, what feels good, what doesn't. And then instead of trying to make the good better, make the bad better. And then overall, you're going to uplift yourself. Because a lot mm -hmm. of the like different tactics, the different methodologies, Michael's big on price up front. You can't give that to someone new in the industry. Like you can't get someone new in sale because they're just going to, they're going to flop. So it's mm -hmm. like, find your process, find what works, find what doesn't fix what doesn't. Then when you do, then up level the percentages that are lower. And like, I think that's the best way. There's no one way. Like if you guys heard my sales calls, you'd be like, wow, these tactics suck. But I, I've, closed, <laughs> I've closed like nine over messenger over the past like day for, for a program we run like literally nine. And it's been two messages back and forth. And it's like, well, how the fuck does that work? Mm -hmm. It just does. Yeah. Yeah. I want to touch something uh, I Will said that I, I think is really interesting in that people get lost on these sales calls. And I, to me, of course they do when the majority of sales training is telling you the what. They're telling you what to say. They're telling you how to say it. They're telling you when to say it but they're not telling you why. So of course, because no one is ever teaching the why up front because salespeople aren't ready. I don't think we give enough credit to people coming into this industry. There's some very intelligent people that want to know why, but they've went through the training and they know what. And when they get outside of situations that aren't built, again, most sales processes are built for the starting point. Right. You don't build a sales process around the percentage of people who are in the decision making process. You typically build and go through pain and all these things. Right. Because it has to work some of the time with some of the people. But if the salesperson doesn't understand why, and it's very similar to what Michael does, if, if he doesn't explain the principles behind why he does what he does, then 
people are limited. And so I think mm -hmm. as trainers, we have to do a better job of not just saying, this is what I say. This is when I say it. This is the tonality I say it. But here's why I'm saying what I'm saying. And people understand that. People don't need years of experience to understand basic communication and why we're positioning these things. And they're better equipped going into those calls. A lot of times, what I tell new sales reps is typically going into any call, there's one or two reasons why people will buy and there's one or two reasons why they won't. And my job is one, to discover at the same time what is the optimal decision and two, to facilitate that optimal decision. I simplify things because then if someone gets lost, right, we have some principles and some ideas that they can use. Are they going to be perfect at it? No. But I think it's up to the trainers and the leaders in this space to also include the why and, and kind of pull back the curtain of how we've developed what we do. And, and people pick that up really, really quickly. Dang it, JD, yeah. I agree with you completely. I was hoping to find a hot button topic, but <laughs> I agree. Now, I me and Michael have been through be this. Helpful. We agree more than we don't. <laughs> With the yeah, principle so behind what you're asking is everything. If you can understand what the principles are, and I think that's where a script can be helpful, especially as you're working your way up to that top 15% before you can really sure. start to expand out, is you go, all right, cool. I know what I'm looking for. You don't always know what to say in the beginning. You don't always know how to bring them back to that to get that out. And I think that's where it's helpful. But I think we're all speaking the same thing. So what's, yeah. a, what's a contentious point, guys? What's something we can have a, a seasoned debate on? I, I, I think if you pulled out some, uh, some individual names, we could probably have a contentious point uh, around yeah. that. We might have to sure. save that for round two and, and have, have a little for, Yeah, for, for round two. I think that, that'll be a, a pretty Dean's big topic. Dean's about to publish a, a, a negative list on his Facebook wall right now. He's taking the names down. I would just talk about it now, dude. I'm I i have I'm a disruptor, man. Like, I don't give a shit. Mm, like, we, we created a program because of all we just talked about people launching sales training. We just launched a program to take all the dumb sales trainers off, and I don't care about the money. And I like chaos. So What's the like, thing I'm that you're for, wanting to disrupt at the I'm, moment, Dean? What you say? Uh, bullshit. The bullshit and the liars. Because here's the thing. When you introduce something at a lower cost, and it's better than that at a higher cost, people are going to gravitate toward it. And then when you deliver at a way higher rate there, no one's going to want to go to the other shit unless they have a unique value proposition. Which, like, Michael has a unique value proposition. JD has a unique value proposition. I'm not teaching people price up front. I'm not teaching how to actually go out and find these jobs. So, like, we roll something out not to take out individuals like you guys, but, like, all the people that can't fulfill on what they do. So hmm. what I want to do is I just want to take out all the bullshit. I'm okay if I lose money in the process, too. Like, I'd actually be okay if we, like, went negative on it. Because hmm. the greater good of, like, what this space needs is worth it. Is it sales not training that's more the sorry Dan, the, is it sales training that's more the bullshit or is it the promise of what happens after the sales training that's that's the bullshit? I think it's both, man. I think they're underfulfilling on the sales training, but then they're also getting people in with the promise. So I think it's both and. Yeah, because I wasn't here. I wasn't necessarily in. I'm, I'm referring to um, Mike Barron. I think everyone knows. How much I learned how much of a scam that was, but I, I was never really in that world. I wasn't in this world when he was marketing heavily. I kind of just read through most of the shit. Um, <laughs> so I'm guessing for for him, it's not necessarily the training itself, but it's more kind of the promises. After, That's an right? extreme example. Yeah, I think that one's such an easy one to, for everybody to point at and go, "Yeah, that guy sucks." <laughs> like that. <crazy. laughs> yeah, but no, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. I never come across. I him. mean. Especially when I was working for seventh and doing all that stuff and coaching mm -hmm. all that, you get so many people that came in and you just hear horror stories and you're just like, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. That sounds like truly, truly terrible. I think anybody that is promising, I'll double your close rate. Like, will you? Mm -hmm. how, how can you possibly say that and promise that without a conversation up front? What if my close rate's already at 60%? I'm going to close at 120. Like, no, that's not a thing. Right? Promise you that you'll get a position where you're making 10K a month. Like, no, you can't promise that. Like, if you think that logically through from start to end, it's like, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. This is, this is back to what I said earlier. They say with a loud voice the things that the, that the new person wants to hear, not what is true and what they need to hear. 
Mm. I, I had a I had a high profile closer about a year ago end up in my inbox saying if I if I promise a three extra close rate, would you come in my program? Or words to that effect. And I just returned mm. it by asking a question back and he, he ghosted me. But it's just a ridiculous claim. Mm, yeah. People it's crazy. Fall it. People fall for it. De- desperate, you know, if you think of the, the three stages people can be, hopeless, worthless. Michael, worthless. Michael, Michael. Your oh, internet bro. Again. He's talking in the background. Can, oh. can you hear me can you hear me okay? We all got to pitch in and get some more megabits, I think. <laughs> Guatemala, Guatemala is letting me down today. Oh, yeah. uh, Michael, one more thing so you can afford better internet. Yes, thank you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Got you. yes. If you think of the three states that people can be in, worthless, helpless, and hopeless, you know, typically it's the worthless, it's people that have self-esteem issues, uh, or the hopeless, why is this happening to me? How come I can't find a solution? They're the ones that a prime prey for these sorts of people you know the helpless are i want to get to xyz who's going to be the best guy to help me do that that's mm-hmm. who i personally target to i'm not interested mm-hmm. in the first two categories but the first two categories get gobbled up by by the other guys the guys that dean's about to name mm-hmm. <laughs> i don't right. think this is the time to do it man i'm getting a little lean and i'm really aggressive so i might just <laughs> i i don't know if the world I mean, is Here's the meta question. I mean, you know, JD rightly so, rightly so said earlier, you know, as elder statesmen, that's what we are. And if we are made of the right stuff, you know, we talk about a responsibility. I mean, does the responsibility extend to the point where those that don't fear the repercussions or consequences of calling out said people actually call them out? Uh, This is a rhetorical, this is a question for us all, I guess, to reflect on an answer. I mean, my (laughs) Facebook group, my Facebook group for three and a half years has been uh, a pretty, good solid yeah, hub yeah. i put a target on my back a few times and yeah, i'm not afraid to call things out. out the difference is i don't want to get in the back and forth with someone that i don't agree with someone i don't like so it's it's about is there something misleading and this has happened with people who i think have solid training i will call out someone who says something in marketing right like the big one was you know you wouldn't go into brain surgery without you know, the proper training, why would you go into a sales call without buying training on day one? Like, even though the people who were saying it, I I respect what they've done, I respect their career, I respect their business, but I'm willing to have those conversations because again, there's just because someone has a great program doesn't mean that there's, they're going to have everything that I agree with in the marketing. The challenge now, what I've seen in the last, in the last kind of year and a half is Instead of us all talking about the misleading marketing and the scams and the problems with guaranteed placement and the things that are real core issues, there's been a few trainers that have done really well and and they're taking shots at other people who have high integrity offers, who have a history of of delivering, um, and they're fighting over market share rather than educating. And, And so I think that's why it's important for us to get together and show that there is a collaboration here and that we're not bickering against each other. For me, I don't care who's out there. As long as you act with integrity and you deliver on what you promise, the market is gigantic and mm. more the merrier. I've never seen anyone do well and that take money out of you know my bank account. And so I yes. like the healthy competition. I like the support. I've I've promoted lots of different communities in my community. Um, I have Cameron coming on tomorrow, actually, and he just launched a program. And I think what he does is, is brilliant. Um, I'm always going to support those people who deliver for their people. But I do believe that it takes a kind of collective responsibility to talk about the things that we don't agree with or we feel are detrimental to the success of the next generation. Michael, I'll answer your meta question with, unfortunately, a meta question which is, is it better to speak the principles that are true to drown those people out? Or is it better to call those people out? And it's the weird one in marketing where the more you name something, the more traffic it gets. Yeah. Here's the thing though. I, I, I like your question, but here, I think it comes back to what I said earlier. A louder voices that get there earlier and say the things that people want to hear, they're not going to hear what we say. You know, so I, I, I could say to you, start distrust as a start point anyone that says three extra commission or double your close rate in 30 days. Like as a start point, distrust that. But I'm 20 years in sales. I know that. The guy who's 19 and this is his dream and heard, you know, believe the marketing and maybe it happened to one guy. 
he's hearing what he wants to hear. He's all about that. Uh, he's going to have to learn some painful lessons, um, mm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, I'm sure we've all got stories of painful lessons and money spent uh, that didn't eventuate and it's made us who we are. So in a way, do we want to stop them from having that experience? Like, there's so many sort of questions. I don't have all the answers. Mm. Could we? Yeah. I think Because to get I in front of them, we'd have to deliver something for them that would then attract them in that would be so close to the conversation that what they're being drawn in by these three extra close rates, all of that stuff. It'd yeah. almost be tough. I'm sure somebody, a much better marketer out there than me could come up with like, what's the right messaging? But I struggled to see how you could even get in front of that, to be honest. Hmm. Well, I, what I, I think, think like, again, <laughs> go ahead, it sounds too good to be true or it sounds a little crazy, it's probably bullshit. Like any type of guarantee, any type of like big promise, if it sounds crazy, there's probably a fucking reason. You know what I mean? Like join us, you'll land a 10K a month job and 30. Like, yeah, if, if it's if it were that easy, don't you think everyone would be fucking doing it already? Yep. yep. Of course, they're not going to push that in front of everyone, because if that were the truth and everyone actually was, it would be worth a lot more than 10K. Yep. Yep. But. I think this is the idea, though, of, well, we can't save the person. Yeah, the person who goes through a webinar, signs up, takes the first call, pays on the call. We're not going to save that person. But there's a bunch of middle ground people where they're looking around. They hear the message, but they don't pull the trigger right off the bat. They are skeptical. They are critical. But when they go look for other information, they don't find the counterpoints. They don't find us having these open discussions. They don't find six or seven different people. So yes, there's always going to be a percentage of the market who's gullible, who hears what they want. But what I've found is there is a community of people who want the truth, who are seeking the truth. But if we all just say, oh, well, it's going to be hard for us to hit this person or that person's, what's, what difference could we all make? And then all of a sudden the voices continue. They're just working harder to relay an, a lie than we are to, to tell the truth. It also depends on what point you want to interact with that market. Like if you look at your model, JD, like I know a lot of your success comes from people on the other side of having had a very traumatic experience right. and you're there to pick up the pieces and right the wrongs and rebuild them and relaunch them and all those sorts of things. You know, do you want to meet them at that point or do you want to meet them before they took the decision that broke them? I mean, cause that's a different, that's a different experience uh, and conversation. You know, when you meet them, they're more receptive because they realize they got burned. They realize they were lied to. They're going through all that that happens. If you meet them before that though, it's a very different conversation to take them away from the bright shiny object that's caught their eye. That looks it very is. sexy. It mm -hmm. is a different conversation, but it's still a conversation. All I can mm. do, and, and again, you know this in, in sales, all we can do is present information. I can't make yep. a prospect buy. Yep. I can't make them make the right decision. And I think it's yep. the same thing here. I can I can educate. I can share examples. I can share my wisdom. I can I can share my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's it's up to free will. But mm. uh, it is a different conversation. It does take a lot of effort. It's it's an uphill battle at times, and it can be discouraging. But I continue to have those conversations and put that information out, not because I think that I'm going to turn everybody, but if I can save one person from dropping their life savings and getting in financial trouble and relationship trouble, uh, mm. if I can save one person and we've been able to do you know 700 plus but if you can save one person i think it's worth it especially mm -hmm. for the minimal effort of being able to communicate those things um mm -hmm. you know i'm not going to yeah. save the planet i'm not going to save the industry but i'm going to walk away from this knowing that i did everything in my power to steer people in in what i believe is the right direction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i actually think conversations like this is is going to be helpful Although Very sometimes, important. you know, we try to spice it up a little bit and, and I'm sure we will, uh, you know, as, as we go along, we'll find some things that are really contentious and be more, more hyper aware of it. But I think conversations like this, uh, will, will, will shine some light on it. Absolutely. So, 